It's amazing that, you know, people know how to break a horse, but they don't give the same courage and diligence to break their child. They'll train, they know how to train a dog, but they don't train their child. How inconsistent, how stupid. How unthinking. My father, I can remember one time I was a teenager and uh, we got back from church and we're sitting around the table and some tension arose and I said something very disrespectful to my mother. And my mother went to slap me. And uh, as a reaction, I raised my hand with a fork in my hand and the fork went right into her hand and stuck there. And so she went to the bedroom and was there for a while and my father said, Bob, don't you believe you better go and apologize to your mother? I'm so glad he did. My father was not a Christian but I am thankful that he was, in a sense, an upright man, a decent man. I'm glad for every time that he reproved me. I remember one time, as I was probably about 18 years old, I was playing softball for the town, and, uh, and uh, I struck out. The umpire called me out. And it was a neighbor farmer who was doing the umping, umpiring, and... Uh, I thought he, I didn't think he called it right, and I turned around and threw my bat down. And when I got home, my father said, Bob, he says, it's one thing to strike out, that's okay. But when you threw your bat down, you sure looked like a weak sister. And uh, I didn't sleep for a while that night. I felt about one inch tall. Another time, my brother and I were we were in 4-H and it was time to do the record books and get them turned in and it was an old hot August summer day. We were sitting at the kitchen table, my father was at the end of the table, I was over here, my brother was over there and uh, I mean we had not been diligent in our business. Everything was haywire, it was a mess and you couldn't figure out what we had done, uh, you know, as far as the records of those calves and uh, our attitude was rotten. And we, uh, one of us made some sour comment. My father backhanded us both. Bang, bang. <laughs> and business picked up. <laughs> I'm not saying that that's exactly right, but I'm just saying I'm looking back on it, and I, I, uh, I'm glad he did. Yeah. We deserved it. We deserved it. We ought to spank discipline for bad attitudes, not just actions. Yes. My first point is, the self-will must be humbled. I hope you got it. I hope you got it. A second point is in 1 Samuel chapter 2. First Samuel chapter 2. And that, my point here is, we need to mean what we say. This is the case of Eli with his boys who are committing immorality right there in the tabernacle. It says in 2.13, I had told him that I am about to judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knew because his sons brought a curse on themselves and he did not rebuke them. He did not rebuke them? Look over here in chapter 2, verse 23. He says, Why do you, Eli says, Why do you do such things? 
the evil things that I hear from all these people. No, my sons, for the report is not good which I hear the Lord's people circulating, and so on. It says over here, Eli didn't rebuke them. Well, over here, it sounds like he did. How do you reconcile it? I believe the answer is this. He didn't say it hard enough. He didn't mean what he said. You better mean what you say. Do not give a command ever that you're not willing to enforce, that you're not willing to back up. Even little things, you know, telling, the, telling your child to go to say hi to grandpa. Uh, uh, tell, tell him thank you now for this and that. Don't give a command, even little things, that you're not willing to back up. It makes a liar out of you. You throw away your authority just like that as a parent. You better mean what you say. A lot of times parents will give a command, and the way they say it leaves a crack in the door. The child can sense that there's an option. The child can sense that he didn't really mean it. There's a way to say it and really mean it and speak it firmly. Next, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3, verse 21. Fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they will not lose heart. You know, you've probably wondered... Why doesn't it say children? Do not exasperate your parents. <laughs> but fathers, don't exasperate your children. That's what we've got. How can we exasperate the children? Here's a few thoughts. One way is by hypocrisy. I know of a fellow that he was uh, old covenant theology. And he said to the children, you can play with toys on Sunday, on the Lord's Day, but it has to be religious toys, you know, like a little Noah's Ark and so on. <laughs> I mean, even, even the children can see through that false doctrine. <laughs> Another way is by uh, disciplining them inconsistently or erratically or selfishly or meanly. You know, here's Saul. He, re he says to Jonathan, his son, you, you son of a perverse woman. What kind of language is that? You don't want a wound, a injured, hurt their spirit. You want them to know that they are, the, they are dearly beloved. There is nothing apart from the Lord himself that is more important to you than they are. They are very precious to you. And so many little things... Little things can exasperate the children. I, one time when we were, when the church was still meeting in our house, uh, there was a, someone who stayed, uh, she stayed long. She was hungry for fellowship, and sometimes she didn't leave till five in the afternoon. And uh, so it got to be about five o'clock, and the conversation went on. And our one and a half year old son, why he got just fed up with the whole thing, no attention, and he finally urinated on the wood stove. <laughs> so again, business picked up. <laughs> but I mean, he was exasperated. You know, this is ridiculous. He saw through it better than we did, and he took action. <laughs> One time I was at a, a Christian's household and staying overnight and the they breakfast was set on and the call was made for breakfast. And so here the whole family gathers around and here the father has this devotional. I mean, and it was a long devotional while the, while the breakfast sat there getting cold. 
You know, maybe that's what it means in Ecclesiastes, do not be overly righteous. <laughs> but, you know, you could just feel it. The children were sitting there exasperated. Well, what, what good is this spiritual activity when that's going on down deep? And I, I've seen also people hang around after a meeting and... Uh, yeah, they're standing there talking about spiritual things, you know, talking about the things of God, but all the while, after two hours, you know, their children are going nuts. They're beside themselves. And so, you know, you, you, you feel sorry for the children. And so, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Next is Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 10. For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them. That's about all we can do. Do the best you can. And even with what I'm giving you here tonight, you know, you've got to sort it all out and do what seems best to you. But he, God, disciplines us for our good so that we might share in his holiness. My point is we should do what we can to maintain a spirit of discipline in the household. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7 that God has given us not a spirit of fear, but what? Power, a spirit of love, a spirit of discipline. That's the way the New American reads. A spirit of discipline. So to have a, a disciplined uh, spirit about your household, that's not an ungodly thing. That's not a legalistic thing. That's a godly thing. God is a God of discipline, a God of order, not of confusion. Do what you can to have a spirit of discipline about your household. So many parents, they pet their children, they pamper their children, they let their children fuss and whine and talk baby talk to them way beyond the ears. Do what you can to maintain a spirit of discipline. I know of one family that had several sons, and uh, they, they pet uh, and they pampered this one son, and uh, that son turned out to be a homosexual. Make, uh, make meal times as much as possible. Set meal times as much as possible. Set a breakfast time if it's possible. I mean, expect the children to be there. If they can't make it, uh, if they're having trouble to make it, they can go to bed earlier. If they don't make it, don't bring breakfast out for them at 10 o'clock in the morning. They missed it. Have a spirit of discipline uh, uh, in your household. It will do them good for years to come. My next point is in Genesis 24. What is it? Number five, maybe? Genesis 24. And that is, teach your children the joy of hard work. The blessings of hard work. As seen in the case here with Rebecca. You remember Abraham sent his servant out to get a wife for his son Isaac. And the servant prays in verse 14, Now may it be that the girl to whom I say, Please let down your jar so that I may drink, and who answers, Drink, and I will water your camels also. May she be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. And so, we come to verse 19, Now when she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw also for your camels until they have finished drinking. Do you realize the reason that this young lady, Rebecca, was honored was because she had an also in her life. She not only gave the servant water, but she says, I'll water your camels also. She had an also in her life, a second mile at attitude in her life. She not only got water for the camels, but it says in verse 20, she ran for it. It's amazing 
how many children, they know how to hustle on the ball field, but they don't know how to hustle in the workplace. I grew up on a farm. Sometimes it was necessary to hire some extra help. My dad sometimes hired uh, uh, classmates of mine, and it got to be kind of a family joke how that so often the athletes, they didn't know how to work. And I remember one time I was with a mission group over in Europe, and this fellow was from Montana, from, uh, grew up on a ranch, and he said, uh, he, uh, he said, it was my uncle that taught me how to work. That, all, that phrase all, just stuck in my mind. Taught me how to work. If it is possible, and it may not be, but if it is possible, start some kind of a home industry where your children can learn and they can learn the rewards of diligence and the disadvantage of laziness, where they can learn the value of time, where they can learn the value of money that it isn't just given to them, where they can learn the value of in being industrious. You know, Jeroboam, he admittedly turned out to be no good religiously, but Solomon exalted him because he saw that that Jeroboam was industrious. And so it is, it is a great virtue to learn to work to hard and to enjoy it. Some people can get things done uh, while the other fellow is just standing there looking at how it could be done. I remember my father telling me time and again, time and again, Bob, do I have to tell you every move to make? And he was right. I mean, it came from, of course, a bad attitude. Josh McDowell, he said, probably the number one sin of teenagers is wasting time. A sixth point is in Psalm 128. We're going back to the Psalm 128. But so much of that idleness, it can be redeemed if you've got some, some job to do, some home industry there. Teach the children that they are needed. I mean that they are needed. You know, it's just, yeah, sure, it's easier at first for the, to do it yourself. But eventually it's profitable when the child can do it. Let them know that they are really meeting a need in the family. It is a joy to them. My next point I see is Psalm 128. I'm kind of stretching this one, admittedly, but in verse 3, it says, Your children will be like olive plants around your table. My point here is, is that do what you can to have your meals together. Teenagers, too. There's no reason they can't pretty well take their meals with you. Do what you can to have your meals together. Let that meal time, let that table be a love feast every time. Let it be an opportunity for sharing your joys and your burdens, your concerns, your plans, your ambitions, your wishes with one another. Let that table be an opportunity for seminary when, when you can tell them about the sinfulness of sin and the, and the beauties of holiness, when you can tell, talk to them about the statutes of God. That, that, that meal time, that can be a very special time. That's one thing that has so vanished in our culture today. Take your meals together. My next is from Psalm 133. Turn over a page. Psalm 133, and I'm stretching it here again, but it says in verse 1, how good and pleasant it is for the brothers to dwell together in unity. If that's true for the brethren, of course it's true for husband and wife, mother and father. If, that, if those children see the father uh, acting arrogantly, the mother acting with insubordinance, if they see that, uh, that tension and that fighting going on, why well, you know you've opened a crack, you've opened a door for them to do the same thing. I mean, mom and dad, you're doing it, why should I try to be any different? Don't be a hypocrite. You're doing it. Why do you tell me not to do that? But if, that, if father and mother are in unity, I mean, if they are in one spirit, that is a powerful influence in that home. 
My last point is Psalm 34. Psalm 34, verse 11. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. When all is said and done, you could sum it up this way. We want to teach our children the fear of the Lord. We want to teach them that there is a God who is there. We want to teach them that that He is supreme. We want to teach them that He is supremely important in our life. We want to teach our children that we must center our lives around Him, that He sees everything, that He knows everything, that He will judge everything. We want to teach our children that the flesh is weak and that time is short, death is certain, judgment is coming, there's a heaven to gain, there's a hell to shun, there's a Savior to win. Be reconciled to God. Lay hold on the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to teach them the sinfulness of sin and the beauty of holiness. We want to teach them the glorious gospel of the blessed God. Everything is centered around the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of the biggest, one of the most important things is by example. I mean your life, your example, your daily choices will speak far louder than what comes out of your mouth. If you go to the ball game instead of going to the church meeting, they get the message. And that is that when push comes to show and there's a tension, and you choose that rather than the things of God, they know that the Lord isn't all that important after all to you. You better teach them the fear of the Lord. I said at the beginning, we're shut up to the grace of God in the final analysis. And that's what we got to do is come boldly to the throne of grace for grace for our children. Maybe some of you have read the, the book Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire, the Jim Cimbala. He tells in there how that his daughter went astray, got off into drugs, and disappeared. They didn't know where she was. They knew she was in the gutter. And he never did tell the church, never did call the church for prayer. He didn't want to burden them. And the church was pretty big by this time, several hundred. They were meeting for prayer on a Tuesday night. And uh, as the pastor was bent over in prayer, someone came and put a, no, a note under his nose. Pastor, don't you think you'd better tell, call the church to pray for your daughter? And he did. And he said it was like waves of intercession came over that prayer meeting. A few days later, in the morning he was up shaving, upstairs shaving, and that daughter appeared. And the mother hollered up the stairs. He said, Jim, our daughter is back. He went running downstairs with a shaven cream on his face. And his daughter fell at his feet and said, Dad, just tell me who was praying for me Tuesday night. She was saved by the grace of God right there. I'm talking about coming to the throne of grace. For our children. My wife Terry was at uh, some friends in Iowa some years back before we were married. Baylor Zupke, some of you know him. And uh, a godly family. And uh, here, one of their sons, when he graduated from high school, he, he rebelled openly, ridiculously, publicly. I mean, it was a type of thing where you couldn't imagine that that would happen. And uh, uh, the Zupkis, they own a sand and gravel business, pretty good sized. And they just, they called a fast. They set business aside, they shut down. And they went to fasting and praying for maybe two or three days, was it? Until, Until the Lord gave the mother a word that their son would be saved. Two years later, That son, Sam, was saved in the military over in Europe. 
and he's gone on with God since. Keith McLeod, a prophet of God from Canada, he's now with the Lord. I remember him telling me one time that, that some years before he had one son who was yet outside the kingdom. And it came to a place where he prayed, Lord, whatever it takes, would you save my son Douglas? And that very night, Douglas came in about 10.30, came in the house. He'd been out on the streets, and his so-called friends had turned against him and beat him to a pulp so bad that Keith said he could hardly recognize him. But it was that, that right there that set him to seeking God, and he's walked with God since. May the Lord help us to know the joy, the supreme joy of our children, all of them walking in the truth.